attending. I see we have quorum and I call this meeting of the Policy and Priorities Committee to order. For the record, um, I am Councillor, uh, or I am uh, uh, Mayor Dave in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, should anything go south, uh, we know who to blame. <laughs> Mayor Dave at Pelham.ca. <laughs> Um, first order business is to adopt the agenda. Um, are there any uh, changes to the agenda that are being proposed? If not, I have a motion that the agenda for the September 16th, 2013 regular meeting of the Policy and Priorities Committee be adopted. This was moved by Councillor King and seconded by Councillor Papp. Any discussion around the motion? All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. First order of business is um, uh, new business, and that is being. Oh, pardon me. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, are, is there any pecuniary uh, concerns or interests that uh, need to be brought to the table? Should that so be recorded? Okay, yes. First order of business is new business, and that is being brought to us uh, by Councillor Durley, uh, an issue dealing with exotic pet pets. Councillor Durley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, articles contained in various news reports over the uh, over the recent past are disturbing at best, and have me very concerned regarding uh, the lack of an exotic pet control in, in our jurisdiction and other jurisdictions. A uh, report of children being injured and are killed by exotic pets, uh, alligators turned into roadkill, uh, a well-dressed uh, monkey visiting shoppers in a parking lot at Ikea, and among other unusual events, uh, <laughs> have you a bit perturbed. Uh, not, not wishing to uh, greatly invade the privacy of any individual, but in the best interest of the safety of our community and our residents, I, I feel there is a need to explore the possibility of controlling, creating a control mechanism, the most likely form is a bylaw, of course, uh, to ensure that exotic and, and potentially dangerous pets are not allowed to be housed in our community as pets. Uh, not only is there an inherent danger to humans who may come face to face with an exotic or dangerous wild animal, but the exotic pet itself may be in danger having been removed from its natural habitat. Uh, I would ask that staff be directed to explore an effective and efficient bylaw that would accomplish this goal. Uh, I know there are many other municipalities that currently enforce such control. Uh, shouldn't be difficult to search out uh, these controls and, and find best practice that we can create one that will work for Pelham. And uh, uh, it is a concern that is brought to me by, uh, by some folks, and, and uh, I certainly agree with that, and I, I think we should explore this as a possibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Durley. Um, you're making that a, a, a motion that uh, staff be requested to uh, research and prepare these options and bring back a report to us? Yes, I believe there is a motion there. Yeah, I do have that. Yes. And Councillor King, I believe, has seconded that. I am. Uh, although it's not necessary at this uh, level, but uh, is there any discussion around that motion? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Really? Have we seen a chair looking as as good as you? So <laughs> <laughs> let me congratulate you on that. Uh, that first well, thank of all. you, Councillor Riviak. You're five two. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mentioned that only because the subject of this is exotic pets. And, uh, that I'm exotic. Are you, are you inferring that? My wife says the same thing. Um, we we, we couch this in 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 terms that are. Uh, they're lighthearted, but the fact of the matter is that, that we all know uh, that, that children have been killed by Serious. exotic pets in, 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 in Canada elsewhere, and so it's serious. And um, I would not have thought that uh, the, the kind of, of, of animal that, that created those deaths would have been as prevalent as other news uh, uh, cast, news items uh, since indicate I think somebody was picked up with 30 or 50 or 60 snakes doing business in that and if there's that many then I think it's a matter of, of some legitimate concern and I would certainly s support uh, the motion that we look at an exotic pet bylaw uh, find out what best practices are elsewhere but but I do think that 
that there is some potential for or danger that we ought to be cognizant of and deal with. Thank you. Anyone to uh, Mr. Mayor? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I certainly uh, applaud Councillor Durley for bringing this forward, um, given that it, it, it has been a, an issue of late and, and appreciate uh, the breadth of uh, examples that he used to explain it all the way back to the IKEA uh, incident uh, at, at Christmas time. Um, I think uh, I certainly think that we we need to look at this, and but I also think uh, when we look at best practices, there may well be um, residents in our community that um, are licensed in some way or function to have an exotic animal. I can think of a magician, for instance, that lives in our community, um, and and so as we look forward to uh, a bylaw. Perhaps we can find some balance between safety and also those that are equipped, like this magician is, I'm no doubt, to handle certain exotic animals. Um, so between that and allowing it, so for, for, for safety. So I would just ask, included and incumbent in this, is some provision to allow for those that can have exotic animals um, in a safe manner, etc. And there's got to be some criteria for that, whether it's with the Humane Society or elsewhere, um, that that can be included in the in whatever goes forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Durley. Thank you. This is, uh, Mr. Chair, this is what I was meaning by best practices and the fact that if somebody makes a livelihood from this and is uh, has jumped all through the hoops to, to get the permission and so on and so forth, that certainly that would be a consideration in our bylaw. But uh, my concern is a person who is not trained that, that, that feels that they need to have one of these exotic animals and, and uh, they escape and something happens. This is what I'm trying to guide, uh, guard from, but, uh, unless you're Siegfried and Roy and their, their animal got a little wild one time, but, you know, these things happen, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's truly just to protect, uh, you know, the, the community from accidents. There are things that may be happening in the Certainly, I, I know as staff explores this, they'll come up with all of the uh, all the information that we certainly need to direct to address the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Mr. CAO, I presume you've uh, heard all of the discussion around the table. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, can I ask a question? Uh, you said that your motion is to uh, for us for a report. Would you like a, the, a bylaw and draft, or would you like just a report? Yes, the draft bylaw. Oh, draft bylaw. You, want, you want a draft bylaw? Okay. Uh, Mr. CEO, would you be able to put a timeline on uh, bringing that forward? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. I believe the staff has already done some preliminary legwork on this issue, um, and I think that a uh, month would be an appropriate amount of time to put together a draft bylaw. Um, just kind of build on uh, what the mayor has said is uh, I'd like to meet with a couple, like uh, Mr. Furlan, who has the big cats in town. I think it would be. Um, prudent if we were to meet with those type of people and get their input on the types and you know what they must have special licenses I'm not sure but and so it might take a little bit more than that so depending on their schedules and that so um, we can shoot for next month but uh, it depends on our input from the outside okay. Okay. any further discussion on the matter before us <clears throat> not I'll call the question all those in favor motion is carried Okay, uh, Council, next uh, issue before us is uh, dealing with the uh, Town of Pelham philosophy. And we have a motion uh, moved by Councillor King, seconded by Councillor Ribiak, that the Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that policy Town of Pelham philosophy be approved. Any discussion? Councillor Ribiak. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this is the town of, uh, policy with regard to town of Pelham philosophy, so it, it strikes me that we better get this one right because all other policies then will will need to be judged by <coughs> the criteria in this one. And in reading this one, I'm not. I, I think I have a, an understanding of what it is that the policy is meant to uh, to articulate by way of a philosophy, but I'm not really certain that it says it. I'm not sure. That, that as a town we want always to rely on innovation to become a leader in municipal government best practices 
or to use innovation and creativity to face unprecedented challenges from a rapidly changing economic, social, technological, environmental, and cultural period. I think I, I, the sense that I have is that we, we want to, I, I, I think that, that innovation and creativity are a means to an end, not an end in itself. And I think that the sense of this might suggest that we as a town are looking at being innovative and creative almost for its own sake. I think that, that the sense that we have here is that we want to deliver the services to the town in an efficient and effective manner and that we, that in doing that, be as innovative as, and creative as we can be in order to come to the best possible solutions. Now, some solutions may in fact be old solutions. <laughs> and innovation may not be, be required. And I would hate to see stuff that works set aside because it wasn't innovative. I think what we mean to say is that, I, I think that what we mean to say is that we want to be innovative and creative in order to become the most, uh, the most effective uh, and, and, and efficient deliverer of services that, that, that the town, that, uh, the town would want. Mm -hmm. I just want to be sure that the syntax of this gets the, uh, the horse in front of the cart and that we understand what the objective is and what the means are and that the two, two are separate. I'm not sure that they are necessarily as stated in this one. Mr. CAO, would you like to respond to that? Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To answer the councillor's question, I, I understand what the councillor is saying. I think that the key word that I would focus in on is that uh, the word strive. So it's not it's not an absolute mandate, but it's a it's a desire to become an innovation leader for the purpose of the uh, service need, meeting the service needs of our customers. So that was the that was the way that it was written. So innovation doesn't have to be you know grandiose. It could be the small things that make a difference in somebody's life. And I think that that's intent that we're really, our philosophy is that we want to become leaders um, because we want to uh, in increase the, the quality of life for all our residents. And, and this, this was taken directly from um, the uh, level three creative problem solving process that we came up with our challenge map for the community and going into the future. We wanted to be an innovation leader. We also wanted to, um, and unanimously we felt that the number one thing we do as government is just uh, is to provide a quality of life and a superiority quality of life. So we you want to use innovation always strive towards that and that was sort of the intent of how this was uh, developed. Mr. Uh, Councillor King. Um, thank you Mr. Chair. Actually I would direct this to the CAO. My suggestion would be to um, condense those first two paragraphs into one. I think it then addresses what um, the group's direction was and also addresses the concern of Councillor Ribiak. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure what you meant by first two paragraphs. Are you talking about the first two on the page? Yes, the first two that begin with how might the town? How might the town become a high performance organization using innovation and creativity to face unprecedented challenges from a rapidly changing economic, social, blah, blah? Just combine those two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I believe it addresses the concerns. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't have uh, any comment about that, Mr. Chair. Mayor Dave. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm a little confused because. Uh, as I read this, and, and maybe it's just the way I'm, I'm reading it, but are not the first two paragraphs sort of different problems mm -hmm. that this solution is trying to solve? Um, and, and the facts are outlined, and then we have the solution statement, which is the policy. Is, is that how we are to read this, or how else are we to read this? The policy really is that the Town of Pelham will strive to become an innovation leader to ensure that our services meet the real needs of our customers, and I guess customers would be our residents, our staff, our council, our you know the service clubs, businesses, etc., by seeking out and solving problems in an effort to provide a superior quality of life for all residents. That that uh, just looking for some clarity on that. Is that how we're to read this, Mr. CAO? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. The the two the two statements at top, the how might we is the way we've been developing all of our policies. So we have a, we have a, a problem that we need to address. So the question is, how do we become a high, high performance organization, uh, and how do we uh, use innovation to deal with a rapidly changing environment around us? And the policy itself is the solution statement. Mm -hmm. uh, the solution statement. 
uh, is just what it is, just what it says, and it speaks to those two initial problems and how to solve them. Okay, so we're all kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, perhaps for clarity, uh, Mr. CAO, if I might interject here, instead of calling it a solution statement, perhaps we could refer to it as the policy statement for clarity, no? Uh, we've developed, we've used this this process now for all of the policies that have come forward and again, it's part of the way that we want to be innovation, innovative and say, you know, policy is policy, but really what is it? It's a solution to a problem is what we're trying to give you and the solution that, that this policy is recommending helps you solve those other two how might be problems. So to move away from that format in this particular policy would then require um, changes to all of the previous policies that have already been adopted under this format. Okay. Thank you. Council Rubia. Thank you. Um, and to quote Mayor Dave, uh, we are all saying the same thing. I, I, I trust we all understand that we, we want, what we want to do is deliver services in the most efficient and effective manner, and we want to be innovative and creative. And I just want the philosophy to be clear that our purpose is not innovation for its own sake. It is to deliver those services. So again, I repeat, what we want to do, what we want to accomplish, are the best possible, the most effective and efficient services that we can. The how or what we want to be is innovative and creative. And I just, just want to be sure that it's clear. And, and again, I, 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 I say that we, we want to get this one right because all others kind of all other policies kind of flow from that, that philosophy. So we get this one right, the others have, have a very good chance of being right. We are saying the same thing, we mean the same thing. I think the syntax just just needs to be worked on a little bit. Well, tonight. Councillor, are you proposing that we not deal with this this policy tonight and that it be referred back to staff for a rewrite and brought back at the next policy and priorities meeting? Are you, are you uncomfortable with the syntax to the point where you'd like to propose that? Um, I, I, I really don't feel that this is saying what we mean. We all mean the same thing, we know what we mean, but I don't think it's saying it. And if, if it requires a delay uh, of, uh, of a little bit of time in order to get that wording right, then I, I, I would suggest that. Unless it's something that we can do quickly right now, but wordsmithing uh, under pressure tends to, to not, not, not work that well. So yes, I, I, would, I, I would suggest that it's important enough to get right and for us to be comfortable with and I'm not comfortable with it and I would suggest that we we work on it. So your motion is then that this report be referred back to staff for revision to be brought forward at the next uh, policy and priorities meeting. That's right and, and in, within the light of, of what we've discussed which, which is that it's not wrong it's just the syntax isn't quite getting it right. In light of the fact that we don't need a seconder, is there any discussion around the amendment or the proposal that Councilor Rubiak put forward? If not, I'll call the motion that Councilor Rubiak has put forward, and that is that the report would be referred back to staff for revision to be brought forward at the next policy and priorities committee meeting. All in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, next issue uh, under old business, we will be uh, our regular policy review or begin our uh, or continue with our HOS, HR policy review. <coughs> the first issue uh, deals with entitlement to retirement benefits HR policy. And I have a motion from Councillor King, seconded by Councillor Durley, that the Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that Policy 301-06, Entitlement to Retirement Benefits Human Resources Policy, be approved. Discussion. Councillor Ribia. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I, I appreciate you coming to me. Uh, just, just for clarification, I, I would like to, to understand um, 
in the dissolution statement B, drugs and extended health care benefit, uh, plan benefits, in parentheses, including all dependents. Just for information, what is that list of dependents? All qualified dependents. Madam Treasurer. That would include um, spouse or common law and any children that uh, are under the age of 21 or still at residing or still attending school to the age of 25, I believe. Follow up, Councilor Rubiak. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're living in an age when um, I think we, we we understand that that our dependents more and more include senior members of our our society, parents. Um, just wondering whether whether any thought has been given to that, uh, whether whether elder care or the the, the need for uh, for uh, our employees to be looking after the other end of the spectrum, and whether that's been considered, and whether that uh, that is something that uh, that, that could be looked at. Mr. CEO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And no, it hasn't been. The expectation is that senior care would have their own health care benefits through a pension plan or a government program. Uh, second of all, it would be, I believe it would be cost prohibitive to put that in and it would cost the town a considerable amount of money to extend the range or scope of benefits provided to dependents, so therefore we have not looked at it. Madam Treasurer, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, it's currently not something that's being offered by the, uh, the benefit plan that we, we have. The dependents are solely spouse, common law, or children. Thank you for the clarity. Any further discussion? Councillor Papp. Yes, just to pick up on Councillor uh, Rebiax, just for clarification, it should be clear what I guess it's implied qualified retirees, right? So that includes part time and full time, because there are some part time employees that would be entitled to OMERS, as we've discovered, right? Are we covering the whole basis with all of these? No, it's not covered. Uh, part time employees are not eligible for benefits. You must be a full time employee working a 35 hour work week under our benefit package. So, anybody working less than that carry like 30 hours of that? Or are they they do not get Are there any benefits. employees working like that? Yes, there's some employees at the arena that are permanent part time. Permanent part time. Yeah. No benefits. They get no benefits. Okay. It's not offered through the benefit package. They, they must work 35 hours mm -hmm. a week to be offered through our, uh, our vendor for benefits. Councillor Papp, have you got further thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, just curious, uh, how many hours are they working per week? Um, it's More than 24? It, no, it's under 24 and um, a few of them have other jobs as well where they have benefits through those positions. Okay. Um, so these are these are just uh, part-time hours. They split three, um, three sh shifts, I think, in the arena on a weekly basis. <coughs> I guess I'm lost. So forgive me. So I don't want to belabor this. So if they work three shifts, they work eight-hour shifts, right? Or so. Uh, they it, it varies throughout the, uh, each week. So the, right. not everyone's working the same amount of hours each week. There's some that are working maybe ten hours a week, and then other another one might be working you know twenty hours one week, and then maybe nine the next or whatever. So it's split up between the, the three employees that uh, are the per, uh, the part-time permanent. Okay. So the benchmark is you've got to have 35 hours in order to get employee benefits. That's right. All right. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess uh, two items. The, the first is sort of going off what Councilor Ribiak said. Uh, I wonder if under B and C if that should be changed to including all qualified dependents, whatever that means, but, but that there's some qualification on it. Um, otherwise, somebody could say, well, you're being restrictive or, you know, I'm 20, my daughter's 27 and whatever. Um, we, we certainly can change the verbiage in here, but each employee is given a benefit package when they um, are come to the town to be employed, and it clearly defines in there where what the uh, qualified dependents consist of. And also at the time of retirement, it's discussed with them as well. Who's, who's qualified to receive the benefits and you know they're notified when the benefits are going to be discontinued by the town staff and also by the uh, vendor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it seemed to me to make sense to put it in, be, you know, it doesn't hurt anything and otherwise somebody can come back and say, well look, it says all my dependents, your, your, whatever, your policy, your, your policy says one thing, your procedures say another. So I, th I think it'd be helpful, uh, I don't know if that requires amendment or whatever to say including all qualified dependents. Just a direction. Um, 
The other is qualified retirees. Um, and that struck me, you're kind of, this is when you get into logic and circular arguments. Qualified retirees are eligible for retirement benefits when they have 10 or more. I just wonder if it's qualified, is it employees are eligible for retirement or, anyways, it, you can just maybe look at the wording there. Retirees are qualified for retirement benefits under the provisions of the owner's plan, et cetera, et cetera. It just, just some of the wording is, is a little, is a little weird, so. The final thing was the um, notice of amendments. Retirement benefits are subject to change at the discretion of council. Um, is there any consideration given? If we automatically, you know, poof tomorrow, change the benefits, is there no consideration given? Like an employee, if we're changing the employment agreement that we have with somebody, there would be what I would call due consideration, whether it's a dollar or whether it's $10 or 20 hours or 10 months, is there no consideration required for changing retirement benefits? Well, the, the purpose of that statement is, is, for instance, when we go through the budget deliberation process, there's the, you know, we, we may change the benefit package at that point in time. So at that, this statement covers that in, in general terms, saying that, that the benefits can change at the discretion of council. We don't need to then go back to the staff, rewrite this policy to say now these things have changed. If we don't rewrite this policy, that, that <clears throat> negates the fact that uh, the new benefits that are in place are what they'll get under this retirement benefit package as well. Okay. So it just covers but that part of it. The, if we the don't question have that is, clause in there. Sorry, Mr. Chair, maybe I'm being obtuse here, but that's fine. The, the, Be obtuse. I'm, I'm, you're probably used yeah. to it. But yeah, we are. The, the, the question is if, if we change an employee's contract or employee's right. uh, agreement. There's no grandfather clause for employment benefits. It, uh, as soon as the benefits change, it, it affects the employee. Okay, so there's consideration given if we change an employee's consideration but none for retirees. Is that what you're saying? For benefit, yes. Okay. And this is covered under the, the whole employee benefit package, okay. not just the retirees. Thank you. So it's just that qualified word could be added. Anyways. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I, think, I think staff took that under advisement. Thank you. Council Ribiak. Thank you. And, and I just want to, uh, to pick up on, on uh, m the mayor's um, reference to, to dependents. One of the things that, it, that occurs to me is that within B and C, the reference to dependents is different. One says including all dependents, the other says including dependents. People are going to look at this stuff and say words have meaning. There must be a difference between the two because we've put in different words. So my, my, my suggestion uh, is, is we adopt one or another of those two phrases and use it consistently so that there's no, mm -hmm. there's, there's no misunderstanding as to there being a difference. I think this, the mayor put forward a suggestion that uh, we align both the policy and procedures. So whatever is in this, the staff uh, handbook should be encased in the uh, the policy, so that the language is the verbiage is consistent right throughout. Yeah. Is that not 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 what you want? Yeah, the word qualified. You, you're happy with that? that? A, a, absolutely. I, I look at these as um, uh, the, the, the kind of broad fences in the yard and everything that we do in detail is within that. Yeah. We can't step outside the yard, so we need to be clear where the fences are, otherwise, uh, you know, policies, uh, sorry, practice may get away from the policy and we won't know how that happened. So it, if it looks like, like I'm nitpicking, uh, uh, sorry, it, it's it's just, I'm asking well, we myself the question. We each end of the table now, so that's if, okay. if, <laughs> if that's what it takes. We'll go with that. <laughs> Thanks. I think you understand my point. I do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had one question, if I may, uh, and that was just to get clarity around the 10 years or more consecutive years of service with the town. It, it seems that that is somewhat uh, different than the original or the policy that we're amending. And I wonder if, Madam Treasurer, you could speak to that. Um, right. Part of the discussion with the, the um, modification of these uh, policies with the work group who helped us establish them, they looked for best practices and brought them forward to the table. One of the issues we had with this policy is essentially you could be 
hired at the town at uh, the age of 54, retired at the age of 55, and then the town, you know, is responsible to cover benefits for 10 years when you've had a one-year tenure or two-year tenure with the town. Um, we looked at that and, and, and asked the Burke Group to come back with what is the normal practice for this, and it consistently came back at 10 years. Some were 15 and, and, and longer, but we, we put it out to 10 years. It is a huge change for the employees coming to the town, and uh, so we wanted to make sure that this was in, in place. Thank you. I, I have a follow-up to that, if I may. I'm not sure whether who to address this to, but with us making this change, um, is there a notice period that we need to uh, have to notify staff because we are, in effect, changing uh, the rule, the 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 uh, what constitutes their employment? Even though it's not a con uh, an employment contract, we're changing the terms of their employment. Uh, and so would there be a notice period uh, that we, we would be required to uh, live up to so that we don't There's no notice per period under the Employment Standards Act. Um, the Burke Group had come back to us and said that there was, there was no requirement to our, on our end. Mm -hmm. Whether we wanted to grandfather um, staff in that, uh, you know, have worked here or are, are retired, it could be done on an indiv individual basis at the retirement time, or it can be a decision. This will all come as part of the next process of implementing this procedure once it's, or policy once it's approved by council. I see. Okay. Any further discussion around uh, this issue? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Okay. Next item on our agenda is uh, Hiring HR Policy 6.2.2. And I have a council, or a motion by uh, Councillor Durley, seconded by Councillor King, that the Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that Policy 301-07, Hiring Human Resource Policy, be approved. Any discussion? Councillor Rivia. Yes, for, for clarification, it's my reading of this that, uh, that the town uh, reserves the right to seek candidates externally in all cases, and I, I think the the, uh, the notion within this policy is that if internal candidates and external candidates are equal, then internal, internal candidates may be selected. But there's no obligation in here for us to promote internally, regardless of level, regardless of uh, of, of occupation. Um, it, it, it's 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 preserved that we can seek external or internal candidates as we see fit, as the, as the CAO sees fit. Mr. CAO. I, if I understand your question correctly, that's, <laughs> that, that's correct. There is no um, mandate that we have to. It's not ironclad. You have to hire or promote internally. Uh, we do have the option of looking at both internal and external. <coughs> Uh, but to be fair to our internal employees, when there are similar or similar credentials and qualifications, that um, we will be loyal to the employees that we have first, and they will be given preference. Thank you. Any further discussion, Mr. Mayor? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to find it here. Well, I guess on that on that point. Um, I guess I understand that. I'm, I'm looking for the solution here, a solution statement, uh, based on the question. The, the 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 problem is how might we recruit, select, and hire and attract the most qualified candidates. And yet we could be in a situation where, with the solution statement under job postings, where we don't get the most qualified candidate because we only. Uh, recruit internally. But so that's that we're not, only that's, that's not what the solution that's statement that's is. Under job postings, at the discretion of the department director, job postings may be paste, posted internally first. Mm -hmm. If there are no qualified internal candidates, then the job will be posted, advertised externally. Mm -hmm. So, so it means that there could be situations where we only post internally and not externally. Is that, or am I reading that incorrectly? Madam Treasurer. Uh, yes and no. Um, at the discretion of a director, where we find that um, there is someone with uh, the great skill set and, and has the ability to perform a job, we, we have the discretion to post internally for five days first. 
And if there is no internal candidates that meet the, the requirements after, after we've gone through the interview process, and this is how we look to promote within the town of Pelham and, and um, uh, make sure that the town staff understand that we are looking to them first to promote within and, and, and help them move up the, um, the, to another position or a higher, more challenging position or whatever. So they look to us to, to post these internally first. However, if I'm, um, for instance, if, you know, when I was recruiting for a fixed asset accountant, you know, within the town, there was not, not someone that would be qualified with the, the skill set and the uh, educational component. We, we certainly wouldn't look to post for five days internally first because we're essentially wasting five days of that recruitment process, but we're going to recruit internally and externally at the same time so that we can get all candidates, even internal ones that we might not have thought of, to come forward for that job and uh, have a fair uh, process that way. I, I appreciate the answer. However, that's not the problem that you're trying, we're trying to solve with the policy. The problem that, that I heard the treasurer is trying to solve is how might we um, increase training of staff, uh, recruit from within, uh, uh, our workforce, uh, you know, promote our workforce from within, et cetera, and have a great team internally. That's sort of, maybe that's the problem. The problem statement that's presented to us is how might we get the most qualified candidates, internal, external, doesn't matter, it just says the most qualified candidates for positions. That's exactly what this policy is trying to do because, um, uh, you know, some of the most re recent uh, changes that we've made in the organization were internally, and they were the most qualified candidates for the job. So it met all the, the components of the problem statement for this. I mean, we've discussed it in great detail about what, what we're trying to make sure that we have in place here are the most qualified. Whether they come internally or externally, we want them to be the best suited for the position so that we're not, um, uh, they're able to do their work from the day they walk in the door, and they're working towards the, the culture and the vision of this town. But are, are we not giving a preference to internal with this policy? As, as I read solution. it, Mr. Mayor, if I could Maybe. speak to it, uh, the word may induces uh, or introduces the right of flexibility that, that the director could post it internally, but by the same token could go both internally and externally at the same time. Mm -hmm. It would be a discretionary call at the at the discretion of the uh, department director or the CAO making the recommendation, if they had identified an individual who, uh, through their experience in the town, their understanding of the town, um, uh, the most qualified person. I can think of one circumstance that's happened relatively recently here that, that it worked out that mm -hmm. the most qualified person was certainly person we promoted internally. So I think I think inherent in this policy is, I read it anyway, and uh, my uh, ability with English is not necessarily the best of everyone sitting around this table, but as I read it, it's, it allows the flexibility within the town to hire internally. It sends a message to our staff that says, you know, you work hard, you study hard, you, you qualify yourself through, through training you have an opportunity to advance within the organization and that we're not always necessarily going to go out, outside. It provides that opportunity there. Okay. I, I, I appreciate that if my council colleagues don't have any issue with this, but I, I, I just want to, on this point, and I have two others, but on, on this point, what you just said, Mr. Chair, is it sends a message to staff saying, if you do a great job internally, then you can be promoted. That should be part of the problem that we're trying to solve. How might we indicate to staff that if you do a great job that you'll get promoted in the organization? That's my argument. And, and people are people are shaking their heads and saying no, and that's fine, I'll leave it alone for now. But, but that's that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. Let we'll have Councillor Rubiak speak to that uh, that point, Mr. Mayor, if we may. Go ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that that's that's an element that troubles me a little bit in this hiring policy, and that is that it doesn't take into consideration a succession planning effort on the part of the organization. Succession planning would suggest that um, you've identified people and hired them at one level and with the expectation that they will move up. You might also hire them with the expectation that you will move them through a variety of, of experiences and that may happen when openings occur. Th that's perfectly legitimate organizational behavior and at times when, when developing people in a succession plan, you might 
be putting somebody into an experience understanding that they may not in fact be the most qualified today but you're putting them into that position in order to achieve that experience so I, I, I like what I read within the hiring policy but I just I'm, I'm just wondering whether succession planning uh, has been well, first of all, is it a consideration within this organization? Do we do succession planning? Perhaps we don't. Perhaps we just want to hire from the outside whenever an opening occurs and not develop from within. But if we are thinking about succession planning, I would suggest that this policy makes <coughs> note that there is succession planning and that hiring may be subject to a succession planning uh, policy or practice if there, if there is one. Mr. CEO, would you like to speak uh, on that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My suggestion would be succession planning is a whole different animal, if you will, and I would suggest if Council uh, would like to see that incorporating a policy that be a standalone policy. Yeah, I think the same thing. Mm -hmm. If I may comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Please do. Absolutely, and I, I, I fully agree and concur, but in that case, the hiring policy should at least acknowledge that there is a succession planning policy and that the two <laughs> need to work together. Otherwise, you, you kind of excluded it from, from consideration. So I just, if there is one, great, but it ought to be acknowledged within this policy. So I'm going to put it back to you, Councillor. How would you propose that we, we deal with this issue? Um, do you feel uncomfortable enough here that we won't pass this until such time as we have either a, a reference to a succession policy together with the succession policy or we amend this policy outlining what uh, yourself and the Mayor has put forward? With, with, with respect, I think there are some other points that may be raised and maybe this is a question that can be asked when all the points are there. Perhaps uh, by the time we're we're, we're done looking at it. There, there may be sufficient discomfort across the, the entire council that that it may may go one way or the other. But with respect to just this alone, yeah, I would want to see succession planning acknowledged at least, and uh, so that may require a, a little bit of rework. And again, do we do it now or do we do it later? Well, so perhaps what we should do is have a, a motion to postpone dealing with this. Uh, and then we can proceed to have what other ev what other amendments you or changes you would like to put forward um, spoken to as part of that postponement uh, motion you know as opposed to going around the circle I'd rather see something on the table that we're discussing and why we're discussing it I, I, I would but I'd like to hear what other people have to say because the the motion may uh, may include some other points uh, in addition to just just this one with respect to succession planning. any other f further comments with respect to succession planning uh, or the wording about posting internally externally councillor Papp well I, I think it fits both I mean you have vacancies within the corporation so the question is what are the methodologies that we use and the methodologies are typically that we Advertise internally, advertise externally, and notwithstanding, you're looking for the most qualified applicant. The succession planning builds in a whole new other component mm -hmm. because right. basically what it says is that, uh, and we've had, I'll say it diplomatically, we've had successes and we've had non-successes where people, and I've been involved in situations in other venues where that's happened. There was a succession plan, but it was not successful. So if we're going to do that, you have to state it emphatically <coughs> here as part of this hiring policy, and I would rather we send this back with that component built in. I think the other, if that's if everybody can, can agree to that, because I think that's like that's a whole different aspect to, to uh, telling somebody, you know, you're going to become captain of the team or the quarterback, and as long as you do all these things, we'll make sure yeah, that happens to you, but we won't chase anybody else. I'm being facetious, but that that could happen. Mm -hmm. And at the same token, um, I think I, I, just so I'm clear and through uh, Madam uh, Treasurer, when we have we have typically practiced as I and and I don't want to put words in. I just when I've seen ads, the ad, when you post it, have you done it simultaneously internally, externally? I usually don't get involved in this. Has that been done that way, or does it? What you were saying is you go through a screening process and those skill sets aren't there, so you go out externally. Is that? It, it depends on the situation. Depends on the yeah, situation. And the job. So you yeah. use we've discretion. We've done it both ways, where right. we've we know that there's qualified candidates. Right. You're going to put the, the five days internally up, and if you have a qualified candidate that meets uh, the recruitment process and right. and uh, is deemed by the committee to be uh, the best fit for that job, then we don't go externally at all. What I'm getting at, what we are hearing um, before, council is that the corporate culture is that also I think we want to build on the positive that. Even if a person is lacking certain skills, 
but it's got all the right stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you'd be willing to spend the time to develop. Mm -hmm. I hate to use the sports, but you develop that player, you know, and work them through to the point where they get to the mm -hmm. stage where, um, and I'm not taking anything away from outside candidate or the competencies, but you want that person to be in a position that they can just step right in. Mm -hmm. And that could not only be in the matter of retirement or other, but in case there was a accident or something like this is a constant problem with organizations who steps in to take over something goes wrong mm -hmm. I mean somebody has an accident illness so mm -hmm. I, I, I want to keep building on that but anyhow that's just my thoughts on it thanks Let me make a suggestion if, if it's possible to approve this policy as it is and bring it back with the succession planning policy because the current policy that's in place is so outdated and it's not currently being followed and we'd like to have something that can, we can set in stone for the staff right now to say this is how we're going to operate but in this in the same breath we'll bring back that succession planning policy at the meeting in uh, October um, to policies and priorities with this one including the, the piece of succession planning because the current policy includes all sorts of procedures that cannot be followed in this day and age with the new social media and the new ways of recruitment and so forth so we're not really uh, able to follow that and having that policy in place is, is meaningless. So without this new policy, we would have no hiring policy in place at this time. So, so Mr. Chair, chair uh, sorry. No, so I'm saying that functionality and the applicableness of the current policy is nullified. If it, it just doesn't work. Right. Right? Really That's basically right. we're just saying you, what we'd be doing is, and again, hiring ad hoc. Right. Basically. You know, without any guided pre uh, planning pr or any principles in place to say this is the way we're going to do That's it. That's right. Yeah, I'm, so I'm just with this policy, if we can just make direction to staff to say, you know, bring back the uh, succession planning policy together with the hiring policy uh -huh. in November for amendment, then we could uh, move forward with this policy and know that we have something that stands up to ESA standards and, and uh, um, human rights code and so forth. Before we perhaps put that out to the table, uh, perhaps what we should do is, uh, Councillor Rubiak alluded to the fact that there may be other areas of concern. Uh, it might be appropriate to hear what those concerns are uh, to see if they were significant enough that would be, want us not to follow your, it, what you've outlined. So I'm going to let Councillor Rubiak uh, go ahead and speak to those first. Um, those are mine. I understood from a uh, discussion around the table that there may be more, and that's yeah. That's, well, that's, so you're finished. With uh, so I'm I'm done for the moment. Right. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair. I mentioned I had two others. Um, well, you go right ahead, Mr. Mayor. The, the policy talks about hiring when candidates' interview qualifications are similar between internal and external. What's the difference between an interview qualification and a qualification? you uh, mr. chair the interview qualifications are those that are scored on our sheets so each interview each candidate has an interview uh, qualifications form and each committee member fills out how they've met the qualifications through an interview process so it's not what they say on paper it's how they interview so it's their interview qualifications that essentially get them the job through the committee okay thank you as long as the, uh, just looking for the answer to that uh, and then the, the other, Mr. Chair, is what about the rest of the policy? Uh, there's a piece in there about no hiring of family. Uh, there's a piece in there about council approving uh, the CEO's recommendations regarding directors, etc. What what does that do to the rest of the policy that's behind here? Can you uh, phrase your question a little bit, a little bit clearer? Because I, I don't understand it. No. Oh, I'm very sorry. That's quite all right. Go ahead. The, the policy that's provided here behind, approved on November 15th, 2004, amended in 2007, mm -hmm. has additional pieces to it. Okay. Things like no hiring a family Nepotism for and, and that the um, council approves the recommendation of the CAO regarding directors. And there's other things, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we approve this policy tonight, what happens to the rest of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. I'd like to speak to that. Well, um, we'll right ahead. I'm looking for the answer. The, the old, the current existing policy, which doesn't really exist, includes a lot of procedure. So we've separated the procedure out from the um, the policy, and those will be documented into procedure. A lot of the background information, uh, like where you go to to interview, so that this doesn't happen again in the future. Because we had it set in stone, you had to go out to newspapers, and you really couldn't use social media or Facebook or or 
um, uh, the internet and even our website to, to acknowledge that there was a recruitment process happening. So all of those things we've dissected out of there. Um, I do believe we either approved the policy last, last period for nepotism or we've got it coming forward, but there is a nepotism policy all on its own, which is part of this whole process. It's an overall policy for the whole organization. It doesn't just go with recruitment. So we've pulled that out. Uh, the consultants had, had indicated to us that that should be a standalone policy with respect to any process you do within the town. So that's why that was uh, brought out of this policy. I think this is why council asked for some of this stuff concurrently because if I take you at your word, Mr. Chair, and, and, and you're right, saying those things are gone, and yet we don't have the nepotism policy officially approved, you know, what kind of double jeopardy position are we in, sort of thing? Like we're in one where we can now all hire family or something. So it'd be important to know <laughs> where those policies are and whether they're in, in force and effect. Um, the policies were sent to all, I think, Last week, all of council received all the policies and which dates that each policy was coming to council on, they were separated out by that date. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't remember which six were pr uh, provided last uh, priorities and policy meeting, but uh, they're all documented in there. I, I think it was at the last council meeting we did decide again that six policies at a time were coming to council. Mm -hmm. So that's how we've been providing them. Councillor Papp and then Councillor Riviera. On this point? Yes. I understand that perfectly. The difference is that this is policy and priorities. And as I've mentioned before, whatever we decide here tonight still has to be approved by council mm -hmm. next term. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and I know it sounds obvious, and I'm not being, uh, you know, if we decide to change our minds at council, you can change your mind. Mm -hmm. You can give different directions to staff. So, uh, I, you know, I know, Councillor Creasy, what you're saying is it's gone, but technically, if there's some changes, then I think the mayor makes it, there's some implied, I understand the nepotism, that's good, we're going to deal with that whole, or that whole area itself, but some of the other, if it's implied that, you know, CAO is hired by council, yada, yada, I see some stuff in here, to be honest with you, that's redundant from the, the past, it's, it's non-functional. But we got to be clear that that is also that there are other implied uh, authorizations and responsibilities are built in that it's inherent in the role of the staff on what they're going to do and can't do with HR. I don't want to bind you. I'd rather, you know, give you that latitude and that we understand what that latitude is too. Am I making sense? You know what I'm trying to go to? That we don't get comps that, well, I didn't know we gave you that authority or that. I, I want to be sure everybody understands what we're doing. Mr. CAO or Madam Treasurer, do you want to respond to Councillor Papp's comments? Um, I'm just trying to, to determine where the, the the process in the policy we're talking about here is it the where the hiring guidelines the directors have hire some sort of hiring authority well, let me let me I'll, I'll help let me help if, if I can you know because I don't want to it's implied everything that is done as far as staff complement is still left to the discretion of council we can either decide to hire not hire depending on budgetary consideration there's things that it says council approves all uh, complement uh, increases right so you get rid of this, it's implied. You do that with your budgetary guidelines. All those components come to us. It's our responsibility to set in place how the corporation operates, whatever resources are. This gives us, I think, has to be clear enough so that how we go about hiring staff, <coughs> save and accept the CAO, is done, is very, is as clear as it can be for the staff itself and for the general public because we're accountable to them. Like, how do you guys, and I'm not being facetious when people say, well, how do you go about hiring people? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to you know, say we don't have a hiring. We technically have a hiring process in place as it exists, but it's not, it's not conducive to what we're trying to achieve, if that's a better way of saying it. Do you know what I mean? And that this is being brought forward here with some modifications, i.e. the uh, succession planning, to ensure that we have all the necessary strengths and tools to be able to carry on. Because the way it stands now, what you're saying is this thing is not workable. This, this just We can't meet these components. Right? Is that? That's correct. And the yeah, I'm not trying to jeopardize current. it. I'm just trying to yeah. build on it. So if it's explained, say, well, how do you guys, what's your hiring practice? What do you mean you got nothing? We do have something. Mm -hmm. It's just we're trying to bring it up. The current standards. The current standards. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And here are some of the components we're trying to uh, do use to put in place to achieve that. Is that a fair statement? Yes, with the succession planning and right. so forth. And, and added with that component in there. I'm not trying to keep rule blocks. I'm trying to make it clearer as possible so that 
you know, people that, and those of you who are much more ex expertise than HR, I know that I just, people ask, you know, they want to know, well, how do you do this? That's why I said, do you advertise simultaneously? And if you're right, if you have discretion and you know sometimes you don't have the qualified people, but at the same token, like I mentioned before, you've got people internally that you want to actually build strengths and get them to stay in the organization. Because one of the things, we don't want them leaving. We've seen that happen in other organizations for a variety of reasons. But that's what you want to build on, right? That's basically. Okay. Enough said. Councilor Rubley, I had another comment. Yeah, and two, a very general comment to begin with, and that is that to this discussion needs to understand that we are being constructive in this. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, mm -hmm. We're not attacking the policy. In fact, I, I like it a lot. We're really looking at the things that, that can help make it better. And one of the tests that we have about whether it's, it ought to be made better is do we understand it? Are we comfortable with it? So I, I just wanted to make the other point, which is, which is, yes, nepotism, if it's going to be a separate policy, needs to be acknowledged within this one. We don't want to be in a position of people looking at the hiring policy saying that you would hire me according to the hiring policy and then there's another policy someplace else that you didn't tell me about. So it's, it's, it may be just a matter of cross-referencing, uh, some sort of general statement. That, that would make it better. I would be more comfortable with it. And, 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 and really, I'm, I'm, I know for myself, I'm trying to be as, as positive and constructive as I possibly can be because I really, really like this one. So is it reasonable to to suggest then that we enact the policy as it is written but direct staff that they take into consideration the discussion around this table such that when they bring the policy for approval at council it will have encased the, the suggestions that have been put forward? Mr. Chairman, I may recommend that this simply be deferred back to staff to take into consideration the comments. We've had the existing policy since 2004. I don't think another month's going to hurt. I'm not going to change things Perfect. particularly. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we wanted here. Okay. I see. I see our treasurer be some concern there. No, I, I, that, that? I agree with the, the CAO. There's too many discussions now that need to be looked at to bring it back to, to enact Perfect. this one without it. Okay. So, do we have a motion to do that, Councilor Rubia? So your motion is that the dealing with this will be uh, postponed and it will be referred back to staff for revision and representation at the next personnel. Any discussion to the motion Council Rubiak put forward? If not, I'll call the question that we postpone. All in favor? The motion is carried. So this will be referred back to staff. Okay, next item of business is uh, item 6.2.3, hours of work HR policy. And we have a motion uh, on the floor from Councillor Papp that the Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that policy 301-08, hours of work human resources policy be approved. Discussion? No. Mr. Mayor and no. then <laughs> Councillor Riviak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, the, there's a difference between um, the rest period portion and the lunch period portion. Lunch, there's no reference to lunch periods in it, but the rest period has a 15-minute thing. All it says is that you can't add up your lunch periods. So just wondering why that's there. Madam Treasurer. It doesn't say anything about that? what lunch is, whether it's 30 minutes or half an hour. Or I'm thinking the same thing, that's good. Um, the lunch period under ESA is uh, one half hour that must be taken, so that can be uh, in, input into this area, but what we wanted to make sure was very clear to staff is that they cannot shorten up their lunch period or use their lunch period to take overtime. It is a requirement under ESA that a lunch period exists. So that was the only purpose for this. Because it can alter. Ma makes the, sense. The lunch can be half hour. It can be 45 minutes. It can be an hour. Right. But ESA would say the rest periods are 15 minutes, right? And that's codified. Rest, the rest periods in the uh, section above are 15 minutes. But that's from the Employment Standards Act, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, I'd suggest that the lunch period portion be, I'll call it codified, talk, whatever it is, at least a half an hour sort of thing, and then have the other piece, which makes a pile of sense. Yeah. 
Um, Does the ne next paragraph not speak to that, Mr. Mayor? Yes, uh, we talked about lunch periods, and then it goes on to qualify that lunch period and spell mm -hmm. out what the actual terms are for the various sectors of our employees, yep. like office and clerical are different than, you know, for example, are different than uh, people that might be working in the field, right? You still would like to see that 30-minute codified as a minimum. Well, there's no, is there a reference in here to lunch? Yeah, the session. For sure. Where is it here? Oh, 30 minute, and where is it? One hour. Office, uh, office and clerical. And clerical. Then it goes down and talks about the. Fair enough. <laughs> we rectified you rectified that. We but that. I do I do have a question uh, about, and this was my question: Why do we codify the hours into the policy? So, this is now going against what I said. I think you put in the minimums, and we say it's a 35 hour week. But why does it have to be from 8:30 till? Does that have to be in the policy? I understand what you're saying. Or does that just, it's 35 hours and then in the procedure you put in, in the hours? Mr. CAO or Madam Treasurer, would either of you like to speak to that? Um, we, we did debate um, the hours of operation that, um, we put the hours of operation that the town is open to, for the office and clerical. This is what the, the public uh, knows that the town is open. There is um, discretion among uh, the, the directors to make some flex time of, uh, hours with staff that might have issues with daycare mm. and picking up their children. That's done on an ad, ad hoc basis with individual staff members, but we wanted staff to, and we discussed this with the, the consultants as well, we wanted staff to understand that the normal work hours are from 8.30 to 4.30, and by not putting them in there, we might see a lot more of that wanting to work outside of those hours, and it become much more um, uncontrollable for us as directors to manage when the staff are in, in and what hours are operating. But um, um, right now, currently, I know in my department alone, I have arrangements with three staff to deal with uh, their children and, and their hours that they need to take a lunch or whatever. And, uh, you know, we don't seem to have an issue with it as it's operating currently. So, but, you know, council can um, ask us to remove so, that. I'm going to be obtuse again, Mr. Chair, so here's the warning. But there's, you know, great that the director's done that, but you can't do that according to the policy. It just says standard hours are. Then the policy should make reference to say other arrangements can be made at the discretion of the director. That's the point. Final point, Chair, is um, there's no, nothing in here about loo time, which is also what I'm sort of hearing the director saying. You know what? You have a no bacon. Your, your kids in the play in the middle of the day, but you're going to come back and work a little over tomorrow. There's no reference in here about about loo time. Should that, you know, did you discuss that? Should that also be included in the policy? Madam Treasurer, I'm just trying to find where. Um, yeah, well, then you can do that. Uh, I do believe um, under the, v the vacation schedule and uh, the vacation policy that's coming will have the flex time portion with it as it relates more to vacation time and how the flex time is incorporated throughout the organization. Um, we are in, still in discussions with the Burke group on the best practices for <coughs> vacation schedules and vacation allotment over the, the number of years that you work here and also the flex time component and how to deal with the flex time. Uh, currently, they have to bank their flex time through a process of having to work overtime instead of taking overtime and it all has to be approved by the director. Um, they will take some time off as you alluded to with you know going to see a play. Um, sometimes uh, to alter the day, they still would be required to make a, a seven hour day um, if they work eight to four, for instance. So um, in this policy, we simply could change the standard, the standard, we, we saw the standard hours are being, you know, the standard hours are this, um, but that the staff could be asked to work outside of those hours. And I did see that in here yeah, somewhere. Page 17. Yeah. Yeah, so um, at the discretion of the director, you can al alter those hours accordingly. So um, that we thought was covered off under that. Okay. Are you satisfied with that, Mr. Mayor? Any further yes. comments? No. No. Council Rubia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I'm going to be covering some of the, the same ground as, as the mayor did. Uh, with respect to um, lunch periods, rest periods, 
As I read this, I see reference to office and clerical employees having a one-hour unpaid break for lunch. Mm -hmm. I see earlier under rest periods that employees are permitted to have 15-minute rest period in the morning and 15-minute rest period in the afternoon. Yeah. That adds up to an hour and a half to me. So, but we're also talking about a one half hour lunch period. So I'd, I'd, I'd really like the, the policy to have some clarity with respect to what I see as, a, as, as an ambiguity within, within this. I mean, I, I, don't I don't really know what was intended uh, with respect to, to lunch hours. Is it really 15 minutes unpaid in the morning, 15 minutes unpaid in the afternoon, and a half hour unpaid for lunch to make the full hour? Or is it 15 minute rest periods that are in fact paid? With a one hour uh, unpaid, I, I I don't know, it's, or or is it intended that in fact uh, there, there are no rest periods officially for office and clerical workers? Uh, in rest the periods record? and lunch periods are separate entities. So that's what I'm getting at. Okay, but if so, it, it specifies in here, and then I'll let the treasurer speak to it. Rest periods are separate entity from lunch, mm -hmm. and. Each employee under the ESA is guaranteed 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon <coughs> as a rest period mm -hmm. for which they are paid. Mm -hmm. Paid, exactly. Then if you read further down and you look at office under under lunch periods, it once you get past the first statement, it goes on to lay out what the various categories of employees are entitled to. Office and clerical get one hour unpaid. Recreational facilities and public work employees get 30 minutes unpaid. Mm -hmm. So that creates the clarity you were looking for, I would presume, but, but maybe I'm being obtuse here. And Madam Treasurer, do you want to comment on that? Am, am I off base? Or? Beautifully. <laughs> no, okay. you're not. It's exactly how it happens under ESA. You're, you're required to give 15 minutes rest period after a certain amount of hours, That's um, and it's paid. Um, rest period, so they call it the break here, and uh, then at lunchtime for the, the town staff, they alter their breaks between or their lunch periods between 12 and 1 and 1 and 2, um, so that we can keep uh, staff on the floor, and that is unpaid, and uh, that's why the purpose of having that statement in there about not having it to be paid overtime. This is something that um, is mandated that they cannot use their lunch period to collect overtime or uh, flex time or whatever, and then the same thing for the outside staff. The rest periods are the same, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, but they only take a half hour uh, lunch period. Councilor Ribiak, uh, uh, follow up on that? Yeah, um, I, I understand your statement, uh, Mr. Chair, and I understand that that is indeed a meaning which comes out of these words. I would suggest to you that it is not the only meaning, and, and, and that's why I believe that there's an ambiguity, mm -hmm. and, and ambiguity of of that magnitude probably shouldn't shouldn't exist within our policies, and that, that's my that's that's my statement. I, I don't think, I don't understand uh, what uh, what what goes on within our workforce. I just want to be sure that our policy reflects what it is that we're trying to to accomplish. And and again, if there's a potential ambiguity, then then somehow it needs to be raised. I understand perfectly that that is a meaning, one of the meanings that can come out of these words. It's not the only one. Could you expand on the uh, where the ambiguity is? Yes. Yes, um, we talk about paid and unpaid uh, breaks, and uh, you lost me there. We're talking about a one-hour unpaid break for, for lunch. Um, there's a 30-minute unpaid lunch break for recreational facilities and public works employees. Right. In both cases, there are, I guess, 15-minute rest periods. No indication of whether paid or unpaid. If they're going to be paid, let's just say it. So that 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 right. I mean, if they're meant to be paid, let's 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 say that they're paid. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and that would go a long way to removing that uh, uh, that ambiguity that that, that resonates with uh, with me. I think that could be a, an easy amendment. Go ahead, um, CIO. I, just to comment on that, Mr. Chairman, everything is paid in here unless we say it's not paid. So that's why we specify unpaid lunch break. Okay. Everything else should say that. Say it. We don't say that you come to work, we're going to pay you. I mean, I don't understand the, where the ambiguity is coming from. 
again, I, I repeat, uh, Mr. Chair, that, that everything we're saying here is for the purpose of making things better. We're positive and constructive. There's a lot of good stuff in, in here. The reason I'm saying it is that it, it's, it's a policy. This is, this is the, the, the pivot around which the discussions will turn. What the policy says ultimately is going to be the deciding factor in some dispute or other. The clearer it is, the less opportunity there is for uh, different meanings, the better it will be. And that's, that's the only reason that I'm, I'm uh, raising it. If, in fact, everything to, in here with respect to hours is meant to be read as paid unless otherwise specified, say it. Then we know. And then we have no, uh, and no issues with respect to that. But when you have similar language in different areas but with some minor difference in, in wording, it leads to the suggestion that there are, in fact, different meanings, and it, it creates that confusion. So, so that, that's all I'm, I'm suggesting. Is so that if, if we were to add a um, employees are permitted to have a paid 15-minute rest period in the morning and a paid 15-minute rest period in the afternoon, would that satisfy your concerns? Well, um, I understand that it's not a question of their being permitted. It's their right under the law. Well, that's that's right. Right. So it's 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 so it's so not a question of permitting them. Do you do you want just it that specified it's paid. or are you not? Just 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 specify that it's paid with respect uh, to rest periods. Or do you do you hear the recommendation? Yeah, uh, we I have no problem adding those there's that verbiage into this policy. I just I want to make sure that okay. it's clear that under I mean these these things were taken right from the Employment Standards mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. and and they're detailed right from there. That Employment Standards Act would override any of the policies right. of the town. Unfortunately, they, it has more jurisdiction to the employees. So that's we, we kind of just took it from that, and that's why it doesn't say paid or unpaid, but we we certainly can add the, the paid phrase the, in there. The first key fact, employment standards, uh, the policy refers to the employment standards and the hours of work, which lay out uh, policies with reference to the 15-minute press period and what have you. But, Council Rubiak, uh, we can certainly... I think staff has heard what you're suggesting. Are, do you have any other yes. uh, issues you'd like to deal with? Yes, and, and, it, and also with respect to flex time and banking. And again, it's, 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 it's the same comment that I made earlier with respect to the hiring policy. If this is going to be modified by other policies, then reference to those policies ought to be made within here. And maybe, again, it's just a matter of cross-referencing. But in fact, mm -hmm. there is provision for flex time, I'm hearing but not according to this policy, other than the standard hours of work for office and clerical employees may be subject to change due to special circumstances as negotiated, et cetera. But really, we're talking about flex time, and there must be a policy with respect to flex time. We were talking about banking uh, time for time in lieu uh, of, of overtime. If those are, are uh, matters that uh, that modify or, or uh, mitigate this uh, this policy, then just just make reference to it so that mm -hmm. that it, it's, it doesn't sit there as a question. So what happens if I mm -hmm. can't work from 8 to 4.30, but 7.30 to 4 is is excellent? You know, it just... I think that comment is very valid. I, you know, a cross-reference to the policy that will be coming forth, I think probably the next batch. I'm not sure exactly, but um, what's your pleasure? Do you want to proceed with the policy as it's presented uh, other than the... the the few minor suggestions that we've had. I think what you're proposing now is a relatively yeah. more significant uh, change. Again, I, I believe that the policy is a good policy, mm -hmm. and it can be made a bit better with the suggestions that we're bringing to the table. And in fact, if, if, uh, if staff, uh, CAO and, and staff, uh, see that it's, it's a value and, and can modify it with some, some word changes to bring back to the council, be happy to uh, to do it that way. I don't think it needs to come back to policies and principles, policies and priorities, priorities, um, in order to uh, to get to that next step. Anyone else want to comment on uh, on what we're discussing here? So, if there's no uh, motion to postpone, then I'm going to call the question. And if there's no further discussion, did you have any other points, Council Rubia? No, I'm good. Anyone else around the table have any other points they want to discuss? No? Then I'm going to call the question as uh, put forth. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried.
Next. Um, next item of business is 6.2.4, leaves of absence, HR policy. We have a motion uh, put forth by Councillor Papp. The Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that Policy 301-09, Leaves of Absent Human Resource Policy, be approved. Discussion? Councillor Ribia. And, and this time it's only a question for clarification. I see that we have uh, a provision for employees to have a leave of absence uh, to be organ donors. Mm -hmm. My question is, when someone elects to donate is that covered by our benefit plan as well? In terms of uh, short-term disability, long-term disability, uh, medical costs uh, under our, our, uh, our uh, insurance plans. I, I ask this because in my experience some time ago, in fact, someone did donate a kidney to a relative and they were left completely out in the cold and in fact their absence could have been considered uh, unjustified because in fact, they elected not to come to work in order to, to do that. However, the leave of absence was granted without any, any benefits. And that didn't strike me then as a, an equitable uh, position. And I'm just wondering what our position as a town is when or if someone elects to be an organ donor. Madam Treasurer. Uh, I'm not sure about the long-term disability component of the organ donation, but the short-term plan is administered in town here. And uh, that, that consideration would be given for all the leaves of absence in the situation that is brought before us on an ad hoc basis, I assume. Um, but uh, with respect to an, uh, the benefit plan package covering stuff or OHIP covering, you know, the, 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 the organ donation procedure, um, I'm not too familiar with that process right now. Council Rivia. Then, then could I suggest, uh, outside of, of a discussion with respect to this policy, that, that uh, thought be given to a policy with regard to employees seeking to leave for organ donation and give some thought to defining just exactly how someone in that position would fit within, within the town's policies. I think there's an opportunity there which will not arise very frequently or, or be, therefore be very costly to mm -hmm. do something very positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any comments uh, with respect to Councilor Ribiak's point? Any other comments? Uh, I'm, dirty in my eyes after I care about. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Mr. Mayor. Any other comments? <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold. Councilor Pat. Uh, just uh, maybe you can help me, uh, Mr. Sayo and uh, Madam Treasurer. Uh, caregiver leave, is that implied under one of these categories? Maybe I, I'm not. Do you know what I'm saying? If you have to look after an elderly parent, it, it would be um, followed would it, under uh, personal emergency leave. Okay, good. Yeah. That's all I need to it's know. Covered. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, I'll call a question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion Motion's carried. Thank you. Next order of business item 6.2.5 membership slash professional fees, subscriptions, HR policy. I have a motion put forward by Councillor Durley, seconded by Councillor King, that Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that Policy 301-10 membership, professional fees, subscriptions, human resource policy be approved. Discussion. Councillor Ribia. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Don't Chair, if this seems like a, a pattern, but, uh, That's okay. but I do have on. questions. Carry on. Um, just want to know whether whether this policy uh, is uh, differentiated from a uh, personal development policy with respect to education or uh, development, uh, other than within within the definition of one's uh, professional accreditation. I understand that for professionals to maintain their their accreditation, they need to. Uh, keep up their, their, their development and satisfy their professional associations with that regard. And I see that this policy tackles that very well. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering whether uh, uh, there's any overlap between the two or uh, whether there is, in fact, another policy that, that, that covers uh, personal development and education elsewhere. I just wonder whether uh, under solution statement, the very first paragraph might answer your uh, concerns there, Councillor Riviak because once it gets past professional certification and recertification, it goes on to talk about any other type of education taken in accordance with prescribed tasks <coughs> or responsibilities. So that kind of speaks to 
uh, the employee having the ability to <coughs> upgrade their skills such that they could perform their tasks uh, more readily and more efficiently and more effectively. Is that what you were alluding to? Um, yes, I, I, I admit that I read this in terms of professional accreditation as opposed to general education. Maybe we'll get a comment from our treasurer. Yeah. Um, the the, um, uh, the ability to, to improve someone's uh, educational component here outside of professional accreditation is going to be dealt with with the performance management plan and that's where we will um, use that plan to yeah. help foster that growth. Thank you. Councillor Powell. Uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, I, I think, uh, Madam Ch Treasurer, I think you answered partially, but I guess it's not automatic, right? That all conferences and all training will be automatically paid by the town. That it's subject to those considerations of what we consider to be, as a corporation, required skills and certifications that we need. Or, Mr. CAO. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there, there's some skills uh, that have to be. Right. Uh, updated and some of those include attending a conference which you get sort of professional credits for so this is only in the circumstances where you have to uh, maintain a professional certification throughout the period of year like an accountant uh, or like a water person who has to get a certain amount of credits and this is usually accumulated at a conference so we're not talking about conferences for personal development uh, we're talking about conferences in the for to getting credits towards keeping your license or your certification Okay, so but the Im implicit here, this, you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with this, the professional certification, and I worked in another field where, yes, you have to maintain the licensing and all that capacity is then, those costs are borne by the corporation. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's what's implied here. It's automatic. Anything else in that is subject to the discretion of council's jurisdiction as far as what they consider to be applicable. Is that a fair thing mm -hmm. to say? Okay, good. That's all I want to tell. Council Rubio. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. In that case, um, perhaps the phrase that you alluded to might not be properly within this, this policy, that any other type of education taken in accordance with a prescribed task responsibility right. as opposed to professional accreditation. So, I, again, mm -hmm. I, I read this one as having to do with professional accreditation. If it's possible to read something else into it that's not meant to be there, maybe it ought not to be there. Madam Treasurer, do you have any comments on that? The, there's there's different components of the professional development that's a requirement here. There's um, professional accreditation for organizations like the accounting and the engineers and, and being part of the membership of those uh, affiliations. There's also requirements under the water uh, system to have licenses that need to be paid for and maintained and they must uh, uh, keep a certain level of education that up, updated and uh, are required. So those are the things that are supposed to be um, the umbrella of this policy that they will that they understand the staff know and understand that those are the types of things that the town council um, will pay for um, outside of that if you want to do regular uh, education con component we have a policy on how to reimburse for if a staff comes to you and says I want to take you know a course that's kind of not related to their job but they want to Im improve their there is a policy <coughs> that allows them to get some sort of um, donation towards our funds towards that cost as well Thank you. In that case, uh, perhaps uh, this, this the solution statement would benefit by adding after prescribed tax, task or responsibility the words that require accreditation or certification or a particular level of proficiency. And that, that way we, we know we're talking about the, the stuff that is required by employees to be legally able to do their job as opposed to that which is discretionary and falls under a different policy. Comments on that? I think that last statement, no payment of fees, Mr. Chairman, uh, will be made if the membership or accreditation is not a condition of employment. I think it says that. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Building on what both councillors have said, at whose discretion? Who decides whether it's a required or will or not or whatever and does that need to be in the policy is it understood that it's at somebody's discretion the CEOs the directors the whatever well I would and that does that not to be need to be in the policy if or does it or does discretion need to be in the policy if we're dealing strictly with professional certification recertification a it's governed by 
um, colleges, uh, professional colleges. It's governed by statute in the case of the water uh, uh, monitoring people. Um, so I would think that the authority there goes well beyond the council. Uh, and, uh, go ahead, Councillor Papp. I, no, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to create any more. Go That's ahead. not <laughs> always necessarily the case because some professional designations Municipal corporations have the dis they have the discretion not to pay for it. I could think of one particular instance, and I won't elaborate. Where yes, you got to have a license to practice, but it was decided that that license in that particular set was the the responsibility of the uh, employee. Absolutely. So in this instance, I think what the underlying theme is: if it's required by work of condition, and we want to make sure the corporation will pay for it, anything else should be left to the discretion of I would suggest the CEO with the staff. If you want to get an MBA to improve yourself, you've got avenues to do that. If you want to improve in other areas, that I think as long as it's reasonable and within the context of helping you build the job. Um, just, I just wanted to make council aware that at budget time, um, all of the budget detail sheets that are in behind every yeah. department They're detail all specifically the professional development being taken by that department. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's approved in advance of the <coughs> uh, budget year. Yeah. This budget just kind of sets it in stone on what what council has already approved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Council Rubiak. Thank you, but we are talking about a policy statement and not the budget. I think it's understood that all the work that's going to be undertaken pursuant to our policies and and, uh, and and carrying out the 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 expectations of council will end up in a budget someplace I, I i think that that we understand what the policy is trying to to accomplish i think we agree with it i think we're just talking about ways of of refining this a little bit to take out ambiguity and to ensure that what we want to have and does happen. The fact of the matter is that it is not the responsibility of the employer to pay for professional accreditation. Um, I think we do it because probably it's a matter of, number one, an indication of real real interest in the development of our employees, but number two, it's probably a, a matter of competition, that enough other employee, employers that we're competing with do it, and therefore we want to include it as a policy as well. Um, but not at all professional or, or, or task-oriented training is covered by an employer. And apprenticeships are a case in point. Often apprentices are laid off for the period of time that they go to school. They're not paid by uh, their employer. They're paid by unemployment or employment insurance. So clearly it's, it's, it's a completely discretionary thing that we're, we're talking about here. But we want to do it. We understand what, we, what it is we want to do. We just want to be sure that the policy that as, 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 as written, does in fact reflect exactly what it is that we're, uh, that we're trying to accomplish. Well, what changes are you suggesting, Councillor? Well, um, the, the clarity, I think, around education taken in accordance with a prescribed task or responsibility that requires a qualified person, a, a, and qualified in, in, in terms beyond just what, what, what the corporation requires, but rather what, what legal, legally they require to have, I think that that is, uh, that would take out a great deal of that, amb that ambiguity and say exactly what we want to say. I understand uh, Councillor Durley's point that, that further down it, it, there, there are words that might imply that, but really I think it should be just clear. And I, I, I don't think it requires us to, to put this on the back burner. I think the, the change in wording could be easily effectuated and, and could be brought back to Council next meeting for, for approval, in my view. Anybody else want to comment on that? So what I'm, what I'm hearing, Councillor Riviak, is that having put forth your thoughts, uh, you're comfortable in, in moving on to act on this uh, motion that we have before us, provided that um, staff would undertake some rewordsmithing to provide a little bit more clarity around the, the lines that have been discussed around the table. Yes, and if I may, correct? absolutely, and if I, if I can be clear, there's clearly a differentiation in staff's mind between the training contemplated here and the training that would be covered or education that would be covered by a policy that deals with discretionary stuff. So that, that's all we're talking about is, is, is making that differentiation clear. This is, is the stuff that people are required to do to keep their tickets in order mm -hmm. so, that, so that they can mm -hmm. continue to do the work. And if it says that clearly, I think that reflects the policy and I think it reflects our will. Mr. CAO, are, are you uh, clear on that? Clear as mud, Mr. Chairman. Are you comfortable with us 
that's, uh, that's moving right. on this and that's you'll you'll that's bring right. it in a rewrite written form to council mm -hmm. okay Good. any further discussion around this no. policy i'm going to call the question all those in favor opposed nobody carried Next uh, order of business, 6.2.6, uh, .6, Office Attire and Personal Appearance, HR Policy. I have a motion before me from Councillor King, seconded by Councillor Ribiak, that Policy and Priorities Committee recommend to Council that Policy 301-11, Office Attire and profession, Personal Appearance Human Resource Policy be approved. Discussion. Councillor Ribiak. <laughs> I'm not even looking down that end of the table. I'm just going right there. Excellent policy. I, I would I would suggest the removal of two words. Suggest and those two words right. are in the employment, uh, sorry, key facts. The town of Pelham maintains the right to implement the dress code, period. I mean, the words as desired add nothing except the potential for questions like as desired by whom, when, under what circumstances. I think we're just reserving the right to implement a dress code, period. And, and, and that's the only comment that I have to make, and I'll stand back. Councilor Durham. Through you, Mr. Chairman, just to, for clarification, what is professional business attire? What's the definition of that? <laughs> Mr. C. A. L. Stand up. <laughs> I would say it includes uh, ties at council. But, I'll lend you a tie. <laughs> well, then I get it's the first time in months. Professional no, business attire is generally referred to as, as uh, you know, sort of business casual, if you will. So it requires dress pants, dress shirt. Uh, we're not going down the slippery slope of trying to dig, sort out exactly what that means because the minute you do that, uh, you know, open-toed shoes, closed-toed shoes, mm -hmm. capris, strapless, mm -hmm. spaghetti whatever else there's going on That's not I, I don't want to get into that so it is deemed as professional professional is pretty much straightforward come to work looking like a professional and we're not going to get into the nuances of what that means because I, I just personally couldn't handle it <laughs> yeah, I know. I just through experience I know there was a, a time that professional meant suit and tie and ta -da -ta -ta. And, and I'm just saying the mindset has changed from that where now casual business is there but professional business or casual business uh you know it, it it's it, it's not a slippery slope it, it's a, it's a matter of interpretation there again and uh, people can look perfectly business like without a tie there's no problem yeah with exactly that. and i think that that again you know you know when somebody is dressed appropriately and professionally or you know when they're not it's pretty evident okay so if I come in with my uh, man prees on and my, you know, silver half shirt, I'm probably not appropriately dressed for work. It's very evident. You'll find people laughing at you as soon as you walk in the door. Well, exactly. Or, you know, a gasping at the horror. But <laughs> it is that people pretty much, you, you know what's appropriate in an office and you don't. And, yeah. and that's... If you added a gold chain, you'd be right on. I could do that. Some bling. <laughs> okay. We have that all and I'm sure that really won't be much of a problem. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> any, anyone else to that point or any other point with reference to this policy? No? <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Well, co a comment. Uh, you might have missed your chance. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I'm wondering what happened to my motion with respect to the removal of the two words. You didn't make a motion out. to that. You made a, re a reference to that, didn't you? Well, take it the ministers will remove those two words before it goes to council for final. Thank you. That's, I just Sorry. understood that you had implied that. I didn't hear a motion. Sorry. If I did, I, I you did. I, I didn't hear that it was going to happen you were, either. You've been reluctant to make motions all the way along, other than just Facts. references. So, I, thank you. It's heard. Are you happy with that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, shall we call the question again? All those in favor. Opposed. Motions carried. To be revised. Okay. Yeah, let's we'll okay. out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the last motion before us, I have a motion from Councillor King, seconded by Councillor Ribiak, 
that this regular meeting of Policies and Priorities Committee be adjourned until the next regular meeting being Committee of the Whole scheduled for Monday, October the 7th, 2013, unless sooner called by the Mayor. All those in favor? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> God. <laughs> Mayor. <Make care. laughs> Good job, Sharon. They, they, they were just uh, huh? indoctrinated.